Are you high? Are you nice? Are you okay? okay. And you mind if I ride with you low key? Low key. It's alright, I'll be fine, I'm on low key, I'm okay. What's good, everybody? It's your boy DK, and we are back with another episode of Business and Pleasure. And I am extremely blessed right now uh, to have Asha with me right now. How you doing? I'm honored to be here. Yeah. I'm really excited. Like, I love your podcast, and I'm excited to get into it. Yo, um, you know, thank you. And, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm extremely excited right now. Um, just off the rip, you know, like, you just dropped a book. It's right yeah. here. Yes. Um, you know, so t tell us about this because this is my copy and I'm going to hold it. And this is very lit. Um, <laughs> it's, it's just crazy to me because, I mean, I don't think I know anybody uh, our age, especially uh, a woman that has like really wrote their own book. You know what I mean? I know. I feel like people don't even read books now. So, <laughs> I mean... <laughs> But that's the thing, because yeah. like that's where it's almost like, it's almost like a, it's like a, it's like a real art form. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. so wow. Yeah, yeah. So, thank you for having me. I'm really happy to be here. I'm an author. I'm an actress. And Songs of Irie is my second novel. It's about two girls, Irie and Jilly, who were growing up in Jamaica during 1976. So this was during like the most heated political time in the island's history between 1976 to like 1980. So during that time, there was like a really big war between these two politicians. One was like a socialist government, socialist democratic government, and the other was very conservative. And it was right after Jamaica got emancipation from the British. So what that means is that there was so many like values of Eurocentrism in Jamaica. Like if mm. you were a Rasta, they would shave your dreadlocks throw you in jail like you crazy. were considered drugged out and dirty and crazy and mm. so there was a lot of like really like western ideas that were trying to influence Jamaica Christianity obviously being huge and I think um there was like a real war between like uptown and downtown and this idea of like you know the aristocrat the elites uh the light-skinned and you know people who lived in the slums of Jamaica who were you know day-to-day -day working people there was a lot of like violence happening on the island and what a lot of people don't know is that there was a lot of funneling with the Jamaican election on the behalf of the Americans and mm -hmm. so that's how a lot of guns got into Jamaica at the time mm. and people were essentially killing each other PMP versus JLP yep. on behalf of the politicians. So my book is like a take on that. It follows two girls, Irie and Jilly, who are from different parts of Jamaica, but they get to go to the same school because the prime minister at the time is a socialist. So he allows for girls like Irie to go to school with girls like Jilly which is all cute until um, tragedy strikes and Irie's sister is kidnapped by a local Don. And mm. it kind of becomes one of those situations where it's like, we're friends, but how much? Like, are you willing to help me get my sister back? Mm. And it's really about the choices we choose versus the choices that choose us and who really gets a choice in life, you know, especially when it comes mm. to poverty and class and, um, and color. Damn. So that's Songs of Irie. It's a lot, but it's it's definitely the hardest thing I've ever written. But also, I feel like I grew so much, and it feels really important. So I'm really happy I wrote it. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean that that just gave me goosebumps. You know what I mean? Like just just awesome. as you were yeah, like as you were talking, like there's so many points um, in that that are just so like um, just so big. Like just just by the fact of like number one, you know jamaicans are like we were just saying this just the other day like obviously jamaicans are probably got to be like the coolest people on <laughs> on the entire planet it's just crazy that like you know um that this you know happens in in jamaica of all places right, right. and it almost really goes to show that like yo maybe you know that contributes to why jamaicans are so dope and why the culture exactly. is like, so rich and exactly. just like you know what i mean that's unreal but and c you look at like you know blacks in the states same same kind of thing mm -hmm. you know what i mean like mm -hmm. these are like two groups of people i feel like that just dominate the world in terms right. of like 
um just their impact right you know what i mean i think like, it's like that like that freedom fighter part of it like people think it's like we hear reggae now and i think we're so privileged because we're we're removed from that time but mm. it's like they were literally fighting like reggae was rebellion it was not considered you know happy like back then it was like they listened to things like ska and rock steady it was yeah. very like prancy you know like mm -hmm. one of the biggest songs was ska 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 mm -hmm. jamaica ska like oh, it's yeah, very yeah. like easy you know yeah, and yeah. when these artists started to come out and really sing about the violence that was happening it was it was not accepted it wasn't even allowed to be played on radio which is so crazy to me to think you know because yeah. abroad in the u.s and in the uk primarily reggae was huge it's, it's you know? crazy i was just like the homie um you know he was playing some music uh he's been playing music in the morning and it's dope because at one point he just put put on like a bob marley like playlist right yeah and and the main thing that i thought was i was just like damn my initial thought was like this music is like some of the most like peaceful and like happy music yeah. just that like the frequency of it absolutely like literally right and absolutely. so it's just crazy to hear that that you know this culture like has been you know demon was demonized like at one point which mm. is fucking crazy honestly and, and also and by sickening. its own people a lot of the time you know it took a Damn. while for reggae to really be embraced as like acceptable and mainstream and i think there's kind of and you still kind of see it today like there's a little bit of a divide of that you know the uptown jamaicans and then the jamaicans that are maybe a bit more rastafarian leaning right. i was raised by a rastafarian leaning father and mother so i think I just have that in my blood, you know, Facts. just that freedom fighter, you know, know who you are, Afrocentrism, like my dad really instilled it in me as a kid. Mm. And I remember hating it. Like, I remember being like eight years old and he would be like, you got to write this essay on Marcus Garvey and I mm. want a 10 page essay. Like, it, it seemed like the worst thing ever right. to have to be to doing at eight years old. But right. now I'm like so grateful that yeah. I had a father who instilled that in me because it not only informs my work, but like the core of who I am, you know? Right. Yeah. And, and, um, I think I remember you telling me like at one point that uh, I don't know if maybe I'm tripping, but like, did you ever trace like your your roots back to Africa? I did, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, they end up in Nigeria. That's what I thought. Yeah, okay. yeah. I was. What that's about what you? I thought. Oh, uh, like my family's from Ghana, right? Oh yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh, I had a little bit of Ghanaian in me, just a little, but for real, yeah. That's and crazy. Cameroon. Oh damn! No, that's like that's a so fire because for me um you know it's it's just been such a crazy thing for me in in life growing up like as a black person like mm -hmm. um you know uh basically children of africans that came from africa to canada of all places so you know i, I feel like that's like actually a nuanced experience i mean everybody's experience is nuanced right right but i just feel like it gave me such a different ass perspective mm. and then on top of that my stepdad's from antigua right. so so my whole like from from like three years old to like damn near like uh, till till 17 when i left like home has been under Caribbean like influence, so, so I. So you're actually Ghanaian, yeah, but full. you were really. I thought yeah. you were. I don't know. I thought you were half and half. Like. Oh, for real? Yeah, I thought you were half Caribbean and half. Yeah. That's so interesting. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's so, really cool. <laughs> yeah, that's like, really cool. I know, and that's the thing, and it's it's one of those things where because I feel like I identify with people from the Caribbean the most because that's like the most like. Like you were raised. Yeah, like you know what I mean. Um but at the same time there's something under me that it, that still identifies though with like the african spirit too mm -hmm. and then from there it's just like you know me being in being a rapper me going to the states a lot like i feel like i have an influence of like american blacks too right mm -hmm. so i got this like trifecta going on that i feel like i don't think a lot of people have that going on you know mm -hmm. what i mean like so that probably informs so much of like your work as well like your music and like just your culture you know i mean you know yeah you know mm -hmm. I, I definitely because you know at the end of the day though the thing that i find like that i resonate with you is that freedom fighter like uh mentality and feeling because even though you know in some ways you know like i like my parents come from a different lane but it's still experienced it in so many different ways, right? Like, and to me, I, I always just grew up like 
with the you know idea of looking at what happened in terms of slavery um and just really like feeling so like blessed in a way that i was born in the time frame that i was born in because i couldn't believe that like if i was just born like a few years earlier would i would i be a slave like right. would i be like like it's just crazy you know even yeah. even like so you i mean know. i just can't so funny that you say that because i just came back from not funny but i went to charleston um I think North Carolina, South Carolina, South Carolina. Mm. And uh, it was my first time ever visiting Charleston and I knew nothing about it. There, There's a book festival that they have called Y'all Fest. It's this young adult literary festival and it's huge. Like kids come from everywhere. Like they mm. drive into this festival and, and they fly into this festival and I, when I got there, I just was like, I didn't, I should have done more research, but I already knew it would probably have like the slavery connotation and stuff. Mm. As soon as I landed at DK, it was like, I was crying for like, like 48 hours. Word. I could not stop crying. Like I could feel it in the, the air. I, I, oh my gosh. It was Yo. so overwhelming. And what was so interesting is I actually didn't know why I was crying. I just couldn't stop crying. Damn. And then come two twos, I was staying at the Marriott, came to find out that six minute, a six minute walk down the road was the biggest slave port for African Americans. Like, like 80% of slave slaves, in, the enslaved, I should say, because I don't like to say slaves, 80% of the enslaved Africans were mm. came through that port. Holy so there shit. was like, I literally walked by it. It was like a mart where they just sold Africans. Yo, and it, yo I got like goosebumps all no, over me yo, right now. It was like, like God sent me on that trip. It put so much of my life into perspective. Like, there, I, there's so much I could say, but I feel like there's nothing that needs to be said because it's it just push it puts life in perspective, you Yo. know. And it's like you feel it. Like I'm walking around, and it's like you feel it. Like it's yeah, heavy, you know. No. I had to like take off my shoes and just like ground myself. But it also really reinstilled my purpose. Like it's a blessing to be here, to be black, and to do this type of work. And not mm. only is it a blessing, like it's necessary. Mm -hmm. 80%, like 80%. So every single, all of the enslaved came through that Yo. Charleston. Yo. And obviously as a Canadian, like we're not as like privy yeah. to some of those things, you know? So right. and it was I've, a huge learning experience. No, I bet. And like, I feel like being though a Canadian, um, I feel like when, when, like, when we do you know interact with that side of history yeah i feel like you feel it more because it's not normal oh my gosh you know what i mean i was to on us. the plane and i was like oh this is a different type of racism like i know racism but i was like oh yeah. this is different like you yep. know yo that's crazy yo, so yeah yeah this world be putting black people through it but i i pray for us and i believe in us and it also makes me see that you know look at what our ancestors went through just for us to have this opportunity now mm. oh my gosh like yo it's it's yo it's 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 to the point where that's literally you know i was telling you this a little bit before but you know like as a black man you know what i mean literally like um, the epitome, not even the epitome, because black women also like got it extremely bad, obviously, you know, but I'm just saying that, mm -hmm. like, I feel like the black man is always demonized in such a like, just yeah. horrible way. And yeah. for me, it, it actually breaks my heart because as a rapper, you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm, I'm now in love with something that you know in order to be myself in it, it it's a it's kind of like a problem or you know what i mean like for me because i started making music when i was 12 years old mm, you know what i mean wow. like um you know uh and i just like i just loved doing it you know what i mean like right. I, I was too young to understand the concept of what's the difference between 1 million and 10 million it doesn't make a difference because mm -hmm. I could only buy toys or some mm -hmm. shit like that, right? Mm -hmm. Or whatever, candy or something like video games. Um, so that was never the motivation. Um, fame, I mean, like, sure, everybody wants to be popular, but I, I still never had any concept of fame and what comes with that, you know what I mean? Right. Women, I'm 12 years old, like, you know what I mean? Like, sure, I like girls, but I mean, like, you know. You so, also like basketball. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, right. So it's exactly. So it's just like, for me, like, I, I really, like, came into doing music in such a genuine ass way that I actually love doing it. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. So to grow up now, to, con to to pursue, like, my passion, and then 
be be faced with like um oh shit there's an identity like like almost like i, I wouldn't even say crisis because i've always known who i was mm-hmm. but there's just a time when basically you know I, I like i had this one manager right and looking back i think the guy loved me like a lot you know mm-hmm. what i mean like he he actually was like a, a decent guy to me you know but the thing was was that like like i was i was sitting down with like cash money records right i think i told you this mm, keep going okay no nah, like basically i moved from like calgary went to vancouver started fucking shit up you know what i mean like just just completely did my thing um started opening for all these artists etc and then basically um a homie of mine you know what i mean made made some kind of connection i end up in miami in at the cash money studios right mm. and for me that was like a serious moment because like yo as a canadian rapper i'm looking at drake like yo right holy shit like we it, all were especially yeah you know what i yeah. mean like i'm like what the fuck and i specifically went to vancouver so that i could try and do a drake situation right. i didn't want to come to toronto because i didn't want to be you know what i mean i mm-hmm. want to be first in my city mm-hmm. that's like i want to be king of this castle type shit and then you know what i mean like so now i'm sitting at cash money records that shit was just like a dream come true like you know what i mean yeah. and lil wayne obviously is the yeah Goat, you yeah. know what i mean that like must have been like I'm, yeah 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 you know what i mean and then so basically um, i'm here and i'm talking to like my 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 manager at the time and he was basically like you know we're working on my branding like okay what type of music do you want to make and what lane do you want to go in and like at this point i wasn't even like certain what type of music i wanted to make i just love making music like right. i literally at one point made edm wow that's like, amazing you know what i mean like i make my own beats and all this shit right mm-hmm. so it's just like I was at the time I started rapping because to me it was just like, you know, like I was honestly making records that were just like trying to uh, put me in a position to like get my name out there. Like I made like I was going to university. So I, I made I remixed like um, uh, House Party by Meek Mill. Mm. You know what I mean? And I just so I would just make these songs just for a specific reason, but not mm. because I was like, oh, this is like my art artist lane. Right. I just love making music. You were music. just having fun. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. So now we're trying to get me like boxed in a certain like lane, which is which makes sense. But then the one, be, you know, being a rapper, like, so I just felt like I was being put in a box and like forced to just be somebody that I just wasn't. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so that really like uh gave me a lot of anxiety um and and it was really a moment of reflection you know what i mean so you feel like you had to be like a certain thing in order to be commercial 100 percent. and this was back in 20 like 15 right so when you look at even music from then 2015 i'm pretty sure that's like the era of like i was like taiga was that like was that Tyga? Ta- Tyga, there, yeah, like I think Rack City times, mm, yeah. Um, you know, Drake, like, uh, this would have been like, um, damn, when he linked with like that- Khaled a lot, and yeah, 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 like after Maybach music, but like no new friends time, mm-hmm. you know, no new friends, mm-hmm. right? It was around that time, like, um, like Party Next Door was just, just, I don't even know if he came out yet, like, you know what I mean, but mm-hmm. so till now where rap is like all about like violence and just drugs and shit like that like don't get me started child you know what i mean like at least then we were going up on a tuesday type right right but like now fun (laughs) yeah you know what i'm saying yeah we were also like naive back then i feel like we like didn't fully know you know like but then it just got worse and worse it got worse and worse (laughs) yeah so to me that that shit is like crazy because it's just like damn um you know like it's just fucked up so there's like the identity thing you know yeah. what i mean um wow that must have been like challenging because it's like we're being fed poison in a lot of ways through the music like even going back to what you said about reggae being so high vibrational like you're so right about that and even like during have, writing this book i had to listen to so much 70s reggae that i think it really showed me like oh there's like a difference like this is like real stuff like it's like the frequency that we're like ingesting like has a real impact on who we are 100 percent. it makes me like sad to be honest like the state of music also just the state of black music because i think let's be very clear like there's obviously an agenda that we are being fed that's being marketed to us and absolutely i just feel like we're like smarter i don't know i get it like we all want to like turn up but like 
I do feel like we're like smarter than what we're ingesting. And also, of course. it's also very like limiting, you know? I feel like one of the things that I love so much about you is your ability to create and imagine. And I just going back to what you were saying about black men, I feel like for so long, black men haven't been allowed their own imaginations. Like, mm. you know, like, and I do feel like it is worse in that sense because for women, I think there's this natural idea that we're women, we create, we express, we're artists, we're da 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 da. But like, when a man is like that, we see in society like how that's received. Like, men aren't allowed to be vulnerable or weak or show motion, much less choose maybe a career that might not be stable in the eyes of the world and, you know, go out on this like artist venture. Like, mm -hmm. and it's restricting because we are artists, especially as black people, we are natural artists and creators. Yeah. And I feel like, what at least what I'm seeing with like the black men around me is like for so long their creativity was just stifled yeah. and like beaten out of them and like they weren't allowed to feel or create or express or you know what I mean like they're not given that same equal treatment yeah. and I think that it's so damaging because I think black boys are the most creative yeah even in like the book industry I've learned so much like with publishing too it's like there's a huge um like gap in publishing in books mm. for books about black boys and often wow. if there are books about black boys it's black women writing them mm. you know and i think like there just need there just needs to be more i always encourage like any black men black boys that i know to create because we need more artists and you wow. guys are our leaders you know damn yeah that is fucking crazy yo it's deep shit i mean i don't even want this to be about me because like it's really about you but i'm just like that's no, what I i'm love saying this, though. you know what i mean like mm -hmm. that's why i feel like what you're what you've done is just so like dope and i like fucking love it and just respect it right um because like it, it hits home to me right and mm -hmm. i hope that everybody watching or whatever can understand um and, and you know anybody who consumes the book right yeah like really gets like how deep it really runs like it's actually not even it, it goes into the fiber of like who you are and yeah. and like you know what what you just said as far as creativity i kind of wanted to just add on that uh, on that on that point to say that like creativity you know is not just about art you know mm. what i mean creativity is also about your life and like the things that you could bring into it you know like the types of like relationships you could have and the mm -hmm. future that you could create for yourself and those around you right having creativity around that right um yeah in business how you know like that's what that's what innovation is mm -hmm. innovation is creativity meets i don't know practicality right right i feel like life is creativity at least for me like it's so vital, mm -hmm. you know? I'm sure you feel that way too. It's like, yeah. really, what are we doing if we're not creating, you know? Exactly. So so what you said, it, it hits home because, yeah, I, I do feel like um, the creativity in the black community has been stifled in such an ironic way because yeah. it's so ironic. We're so but, creative. Yeah. You know, one thing that I've discovered on this journey, which is like, it's a bit of a hot take, and I just say this because I actually, I just want more young people anybody listening to this young old whatever like tell your story like we need it like we actually need it mm. and i feel like what creating and writing my own stories has kind of showed me is honestly like i get why people don't do it damn yeah <laughs> word i do and i hate to say that but it's like sometimes we can also be our own worst enemies you know like mm. we're held to such a higher level as black creators where it's like when you're creating something there's such a social responsibility it's like what's mm. your message what's your purpose and everybody wants to feel represented because there's you know there's not enough of our stories out there right. which makes total sense but i think what can happen is sometimes we start to fall into the trap of this idea that we're a monolith and we're not which mm. is why we need more stories we need more people to tell their individual experiences and feel like their stories are worth telling so exactly. that we can have the variety of stories that you see white people have like they have all the stories you know exactly so yeah yo man tea. it's tea <laughs> Yo, this shit is it's yo. tea. It's yeah. tea. Yeah. <laughs> no, for sure, for sure. Yeah. Um. So the one thing I I should have I should have said this at the very beginning because this could have gave people like a more like perspective on who you are or whatever. But mm -hmm. you're a full blown actor. You know I what am. I mean. You were in 
uh, Riverdale. I was in Riverdale, yes. So, <laughs> what the fuck? That's I know, crazy. it's pretty nuts. I'm sitting here with a celebrity right now. Thank you, I appreciate that. Like yeah. I said, I think I'm a little late to my own celebrity. I was telling you off camera, but I'm so <laughs> I'm so grateful for that experience. I also did a show, Lock and Key. If y'all haven't checked it out, check it out. It's also a great one. Um, Riverdale was, it was an interesting experience, <laughs> you know? I feel like I grew a lot. I'm grateful beyond measure for that platform. You know, Roberto, the creator who believed in us and, you know, really wanted to like push for our own show and all that stuff and just really believed in like the representation of three black women mm. in a group together, which will go down in history, not just in life, but even in my own mind of like, you know, I remember booking that show was like, first of all, it was strenuous. The audition process was insane. It was like months and months of going in and auditioning and reading. And, you know, there was like a point where I was like crying on the phone with my agent. And I was like, they clearly don't want me. Like they're just, <laughs> they're just bringing me, but they were doing this to everybody. You yeah. know, it was so anxiety driven because you knew that it was such a big, it's Archie comics, you know, Yeah. they weren't greenlit, but it was just still like, this would be epic, you know, yeah. just in the pussycats. And Damn. I always remember like, it came out right before I went into the final audition that they had casted Josie, um, mm. Ashley Murray, who's a black actress. And I remember being like, why are they bringing me in then? Like they have their, the black girl, like they're not gonna do three black girls in Damn. this group. Isn't that so messed up? Like the thought Yo. process, like you think in your head, you're like, yeah, they got, they got their girl. Like Damn. <laughs> they're not gonna have two black girls and a white girl. Like that was like the mentality, especially back then, you know? Yeah, what? It was crazy. Yeah. And I remember just going to the audition and you know, other women expressed similar sentiments. And I remember booking it and being like, this is insane. Yeah. But then I remember going to the uh, fitting and then seeing Ashley and then seeing Haley who played Valerie and she was biracial. And I was like, we're all black. That's like crazy. it was, it was groundbreaking. Yeah. And I, and that, and I say that because that experience really opened up my own mind about how limiting my own beliefs were because of what I had seen in media. Like you always only see the token black girl, mm. you know what I mean? And I think, what that show did for me was really obliterate that idea in my mind and show me that like not only can you have more than one but you need to because we're different people like right. all three of us were completely different women Yo. and i think sometimes what media does it puts us in that trap of like when you only see one you start to think of yourself in boxes like right. you know what 100%. i mean Hundred percent. like you start to deny your own nuanced humanity and I think we all learned that lesson on that show that we are individuals and that we are amazing. Like we deserve to be three black women in a group because that's just what it is, you know? Yeah, yeah. And it's Josie and the Pussycats, which is just iconic because they took two white characters and made them black, so. Yeah, yeah. no, that right there is beautiful. You know what I'm saying? Like that is absolutely, um, shout out to Riverdale for that. Yeah. Like, yeah, like yeah. really. And, for real. And I, yeah. and I got a lot of respect for um you know when you know it's it's rare it's new but yeah. when that happens like and on network television too i think like yeah that's also like it was it was a lot it was really it's a big show like that wasn't just a regular ass like show that like nobody watched type shit that it was, was like, weird though being in it because i think when you and you can probably attest to this too with your career like when you're in it you don't really realize Mm. you know mm -hmm. i don't know like you're it's it's hard to fully know like your reach and your impact like we knew it was like a big deal but i don't know it's like when your mom's telling you it's like you're like okay mom i don't know it's it was a weird adjustment i think yeah yeah no it's it is like that though right like you know but it's just a blessing yeah you know like yeah. really really yeah. really so i'm so happy like uh, uh for that you know like for you um and and i was even gonna say like you know one of the things that it's similar to is like they they casted you know a black like little mermaid for example right exactly oh my gosh so Howie. she's that's, amazing i was like yo shout out to them i wanted to watch it i didn't even watch it yet but that's I saw just some of it you yeah. see some of it mm -hmm. is it crazy she's amazing it yo. just is so it's also just like it's what's right like duh like we're human beings you know like yeah. it's like it makes you wonder why we've been out i mean we know why we've been out of the conversation but it's yeah you know it's clear like we're talented yeah. we are literally talented we are like black people are the heartbeat of creativity so of course we can play these roles and embody these characters you know 100 percent, 100 percent. yeah um i mean black people are like the are literally the birth 
you know what I mean? Uh, uh, the the cradle, like, you know, like, Africa's the cradle of humanity. Mm-hmm. Like, you know what I mean? Like, so why are we confused? Why are we confused? Why do we doubt the fact that a black person could be uh, creative or intelligent right. when creativity and intelligence came from black people? Like, all people came from black people. So, why, what, 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 like, right. why are we so confused? You know what I mean? Like, as a society. And so, you know, um, like... For me, I respect you in writing a book at this age because that shows that intellectual side Mm -hmm. that, you know what I mean? That that is like, I feel like you're a pioneer in that lane right now. Like, Thank you, DK. That's so nice. Oh, for sure. I appreciate that. No, but it's just true, though. Like, it's not even... I'm just speaking the facts. I know. You know what I mean? Again, like, one of those things where it's like when you're in it, you don't see it kind of. But I think it's like for me, writing was necessary. I never, I mean, I would have liked to be an author. I was writing, I remember writing my first book at like 12. Like or it was called The Truth About Megan Riley. And it was kind of like a Pretty Little Liars vibe of like these girls and middle school and bullying. And um, I don't know. I never really like, I had it on the side, but I, I didn't feel like, oh, I'm going to be an author one day, like maybe. Mm. But writing for me now really came out of the lack of material I was seeing in Hollywood, being an actress for so long. And like I said, you constantly get these roles that are so one dimensional. And you're like, Mm. okay, how many times can you be that girl that they're trying to cast? You know, you start to believe it. You start to believe that limiting narrative, like you can't be anything else. And it's so not true. And I just got to a point in my life where I was like, I was really tired of that narrative and I wanted to see something more nuanced about black women because I'm like, the black people I know are mothers and sisters and daughters and fathers and brothers and cousins, like we have, we're, we're more than just what we look like, you know? We have stories that go beyond that. And I just was like, okay, but if no one's gonna like give me that material, then I have to write it. And yeah. so that's where writing kind of came from for me. Dope, yeah. dope. Yo, it's fire. It's just weird because I never thought I would be like, oh yeah, like I'm an author. But it was more like, if I just, it was more like I got to do this shit myself because clearly no one's gonna do it. So let me just get to work. That yeah. is like more my vibe, you know? Yo, facts. Yeah, that's so. What like, you know, when we met, we met in L. A. Um, yeah. You know, shout out to shout out to Ashley. Shout out hey, to Cash. Ashley. Yes, Cash. You know, <laughs> I think I was writing this book when we met. I think I was yeah, you were, it. and I remember like how hard it was for you, right? Like you, um, just the creativity aspect of things, right? And like, I think that it was at that moment, like it wasn't even that you were, um, it it wasn't even that you were like um, having troubles writing the book. I felt like you were having just troubles, like dealing with like the rest of like life you know what i mean Mm -hmm. just by the fact that you were like uh, and now i feel like i understand actually because um of how like all consuming and how serious this topic is right yeah and then to convert that into an actual like story right right right. um you know and have it be like factually like accurate right yeah that that so now i now i actually understand like (laughs) why yeah 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 but you were definitely going through it um (laughs) yeah i was by the way like it's so funny after i wrote it like i found out from my agent she was like you know it's called i think it's called like the sophomore slump it's like a thing in the writing if you talk to authors they literally all say that your sophomore book is the hardest book and Mm. i'm like great someone could have told me no one told me but everybody says how it's the hardest thing ever and it's actually because you're fr- and it's probably like this with music it's like your first thing is so pure from your heart mm. and then your second one is like you hear everybody's thoughts on what you're doing and so you're trying to like block out that noise and still stay like pure to what god has called you to do you right, know it's right. a very like interesting balance because you're trying to really carve out your voice you yeah, know yeah 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 anyway i just thought that was so, funny but no i was going through it <laughs> yeah yeah that's crazy um so and that's also we're just like uncovering um gems as we go as we Mm -hmm. like you know progress (laughs) but so you're also an actor and this is actually your second book Mm -hmm. i'm gonna hold it up again because i don't think you guys understood uh yeah but it's it's, thick she thick yeah 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 (laughs) um and this is your second book so tell us about the first one 
So the first one is Hurricane Summer, mm-hmm. which is my baby. It's actually being adapted to be a movie, which I'm really excited about filming next year in Jamaica. Stop. Yeah, I didn't tell you that. No. No, you know that, DK. You didn't tell me. You, I knew that it was going down, but like, I, yeah. I didn't know. No, back then you were in the process of like... Was uh, I writing it? I think I was writing the movie. I think so, yo. I'm not sure, but yeah, was. it wasn't for sure. You had some meetings, but <laughs> okay. I wasn't sure, though. <laughs> One of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah we'll so, talk damn. more. <laughs> yeah. What? There's a lot, but we'll talk. We'll talk. But yo. yeah, I was writing it at the time when you met me, which was crazy. Again, like, I don't know. I'm 29 now. I just had my birthday. I think like that part of my 20s was, was so interesting because I was like, bring it on. Like, I'm going to do, I'm going to write all these stories. And I still feel that way, but... I think to your point, I was a little naive in how much of a workload it was because I was writing Songs of Irie and then also writing the Hurricane Summer script at the same time. Yeah. So pretty intense. Really excited about that. I'm fucking tripping, yo. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. And the screenplay is like pretty crazy. <laughs> I can what? say that because I wrote it. <laughs> yo. Yeah, we'll talk though. <laughs> okay, so yeah. let's just. <laughs> um, so run us through the. Hurricane Summer, yeah. yeah. So, okay, so Hurricane Summer is a story it's a coming of age story about a girl named tilla and on her 18th birthday she goes to jamaica to visit her dad for the summer her and her little sister mia and her dad lives in jamaica her parents are still together but it's kind of like a rocky relationship he lives in jamaica part-time and does business there Mm. and tilla is essentially forced to go spend the summer with her dad she's not happy about it she's resentful that he hasn't been home um, and that he always leaves to go and work and essentially when she gets there everything hits the fan like it's literally about the uncovered like looking at the veil beyond paradise she ends up going to stay in the countryside of jamaica with her dad and her dad's family he ends up leaving them there because he's got some work to take care of in kingston and i mean it's about so many things right like it's about there's like a love triangle between her and her cousin's man so like that's a whole thing but then also it's also about like the slut shaming that happens to young women at that age you know like it's this young girl exploring her sexuality but then all of a sudden you know the neighborhood starts to chat and people have things to say Mm. and it gets back to her dad and the Mm. wrath that she has to deal with from him but also how you know her actions are pretty much a mirror of like the relationship that she doesn't have with her dad you know it's like she's searching for herself and other people and so it's really about the father-daughter dynamic Mm. it's about healing that dynamic and like how an absent father leads you know can have a lot of impact on a young woman's decisions right you know the sexual shame that we put on women how we shame girls who are like exploring their sexualities and then also she finds out her dad has a whole secret life so that's also tea so it's a it's a lot but um Yo. ultimately it's about intergenerational trauma and healing and and the healing of young girls you know like really healing of like young black women Yo. yes yeah, it's, it's deep that's another <laughs> deep. one yeah damn now, I know. now you're two for two with it like yeah uh crazy. um okay you know so. what's crazy though like sometimes i'm like oh my god i'm like two books like i'm so tired and then i go to this book festival and i'm talking to these authors and they're on like book 25 i'm like how i think i'm like doing some stuff and there are authors out there that are like our age that are like yeah i'm on my 25th book and you're like i mean hey different yo good for them but, but at it the just end goes of to the show there's like more stories you know what i mean yeah but at the same time i mean i haven't read their books but True. this this is quality though yeah like i'm not even i haven't even you know what i mean like I, yeah i haven't even like gotten into it yet and still just by the overall like concept of it both stories got me like extremely like damn mm. like you know what i mean like yo like i feel it and i'm not even a a, a woman like yeah. you know what i mean yeah but like so that's crazy and actually you. um you you touched on a couple like very dope ass um themes there um first one being obviously father daughter relationship right yeah um obviously we know uh where that can go right mm-hmm. people know that but at the end of the day not a lot of people um i feel like give credit to it or at all you know they look at it like almost the same way as like hey oh yeah like you you black people are like violent and sell drugs and shit like that same way oh yeah she's got daddy issues well this is the thing and i was like i just remember thinking to myself like daddy issues like daddy issues like well what do you do with daddy issues what is this like how come what do we do with the girls who have daddy issues like 
what do we do with them? Like, no one talks about the next part of it. It's just like, yeah, daddy issues. Well, why? What is that? How can we go into that? How can we really look at what that is, you know? And it was through my relationship with my father, who I'm so close with now, but at the time, it was like a lot of what I was experiencing and having to like work through that as a young woman and find healing and forgiveness for your parents and the ways in which you feel like they've let you down. And I think also just in general, like everybody's got some like parental trauma deep down. And so like being able to like look at your parent and find like compassion for them, even when you feel like they're failing you, it's like that I think is like the ultimate it's just the ultimate like form of love because I think, I mean, not to give away the book, but really when you learn to forgive, you also kind of free yourself Absolutely. of that burden or that expectation that's also being put onto you. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, you know, yeah, hundred percent. And then also too, the next thing, you know, that usually I think what they say is that like daddy issues, uh, you know, snowballs into sometimes uh being promiscuous right 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 and so uh then you then you have like you know um women that might say for example get with the wrong guy or Mm. is the wrong dynamic and then because they actually had good intentions for it like it's not like they're like you know what i mean right um you just want you're hoping the best it's like naive a little yeah Mm -hmm. and then sometimes like where it really goes sideways and snowballs to the next thing is then they might have kids now at this point now you know what i mean and then society looks at single mothers in a certain way and then now now we're looping back and it becomes a cycle right Mm. um and you know i feel like that that is something that for me i look at it like yo like you know obviously i'm a, a a young guy right and so like you know during the dating process i mean like even just talking to the homies like how many homies are saying like oh like she's got like kids like you know fuck that type shit right Mm. and actually um you know my very first girlfriend that i was like extremely in love with um had a kid right Mm. and man i was like just stupid in love with this girl Mm. like this girl was really actually like my dream girl like Mm -hmm. type thing or i don't know but i've always been watching like movies from young you know what i mean so Mm -hmm. i just had like a romanticized idea of love and shit like that so this girl to me was just like damn like i if i had to draw a girl this This would have been hit her Right. right but at the same time she she had a kid right and so that shit fucked with me so bad right because Mm -hmm you know like that that fucked with me so bad because okay sure there's like the aspect of like i feel like every man kind of feels like in some way like oh shit like that's not my kid like like i don't give a fuck like you know what i mean like that's how guys just feel right mm-hmm. um but at the same time though i feel like even that is also rooted in trauma and i and i definitely think that that actually was linked to like um my upbringing and not having my dad around right mm-hmm. so now we got like perpetual cycles that like came out in me to even where like the point where like that i was like ex- like unbelievably like like yo this girl like i swear like i would do anything like you know what i mean like yeah. i was like crazy like yeah. you know what i mean like mm-hmm. that type of shit um the type of shit that is just like yo but i still couldn't do it i, I still couldn't do it though mm-hmm. like i still like did her wrong type shit mm-hmm. like you know what i mean like i did her wrong like mm-hmm. and that's not even it's in multiple ways like there's there first of all like i never like accepted her like kid you know what i mean like um and i mean at this time at this point i'm young as shit though too right right, like i'm like at this point i'm like 17 18 you know what i mean like (laughs) i was young you know what i mean but at the same time that didn't take away from how i feel because i'm even like over 10 years later now i'm still speaking like highly of like of what i felt you know what i mean um so you know i didn't accept her like son you know um i probably made her feel like shit about it you Mm -hmm. know what i mean um and also because like she was doing her her best to like be a good like girl for me like you know like i was this was back when i was like at sfu and shit like that right um and so she would like come uh you know like just spend time with me and stuff like that like spending time away from like her like son type shit Mm -hmm. so she was already sacrificing shit for me and i looked at it like that wasn't even enough because 
you know what I'm saying? Like, I just wanted a girl to, to fit, like, the typical girlfriend role, right? right? So I'm saying all this shit to say that, like, you know, I feel like it's, like, a toxic thing in, uh, in men right now when we look at women that have kids as like lesser mm. you know what i mean like single mothers you know they're right. they're like the butt of the joke you know what i mean and mm. like that shit is like foul um because at the end of the day yo like they produce life like there's oh, nothing for sure. right, right. Like, there's literally nothing there's <laughs> nothing like what exists without those mothers yeah, yeah there's no downsides to it it's yeah. literally a beautiful thing yeah, and for sure obviously i've grown to like understand that mm -hmm. you know what i mean mm -hmm. um so now my approach is different mm -hmm. right like in terms of how i just view shit but at the same time um yeah like so that's kind of like as soon as you said that i was just like yo that's a deep ass issue like it's that's so deep it's like we judge women so hard in this society like so hard and yep. i feel like there's no space for a young woman trying to figure it out there's no space for a young woman making mistakes like like i said it's like men boys are encouraged you know go, and to a point where it can be toxic but you know go yeah. pursue conquer explore and with women there's like this purity myth where it's like well as, as soon as that happens like you're no long like you're soiled no one's gonna like want you anymore you know right. and that's what hurricane summer really explores it's like you see it through the eyes of tilla who's just turned 18 but she's also on this vacation with her little sister who's being treated completely differently who's still daddy's little princess and is like you know tossed up in the air and like loves her dad and doesn't have the same complicated relationship that tilla has but mm. the only reason that that Tilla has that relationship with her dad is because the expectations are different. It's like, oh, you think you're a big old man now? You think you're gonna go out to street and be with boys? Like, you know what I mean? It's almost like it's like girls are villainized sometimes mm. for their sexual exploration. And I know I felt that way growing up a lot. And I just felt like it wasn't, it's not that it's not fair because I get like a lot of the times it comes from this aspect of wanting to protect women, but I feel like the ways in which we teach women about their sexualities is not right. Like it's not really healthy um, mm. and it's not really sacred. You know, we don't really offer compassion ever. And I felt like I wanted to know why that was, you know, I wanted to know like why is it so hard with like fathers and daughters like what is that and so i think the book really it really looks at it and it's like it's about abandonment issues you know and really confronting that head on and i think it did so well because so many people can relate to that like be that feeling of like abandonment from a parent you know and wanting to get answers and seeking answers in other people trying to like fill that void yep. with romantic relationships 100 percent, 100 percent. i mean it's deep it's deep is deep, deep, yo. deep. Get the book. Hurricane Summer available now. Yo. Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Chapters, everywhere books are sold. <laughs> yo, hell yeah. 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 Man, that shit is deep, <laughs> it's so yo. heavy. Like, I feel like my book is like it's it, my, it reminds me of like the modern day color purple. Like, my books are very like heavy, but it has to be done. Like, these are the things I feel like like we can't heal what we don't reveal and right. i feel like we don't reveal a lot sometimes in you know our communities because there is such a responsibility to want to appear perfect and not show our dirty laundry but i kind of feel like we do ourselves a disservice when we don't because to show our dirty laundry is to say hey we're human just like you and these 100%. are our stories you know yeah yep. and we're more alike than you think we are different you know yeah yo yeah 100 percent. 100 percent. yeah um hold on let me just check the how much time we got going. Mm -hmm. i feel like these podcasts go so fucking quick it's not even funny like. this is so cool though you're inspiring me yeah yeah See, we're almost at two hours wow that's crazy i know that's crazy that's what i'm saying it's like you go into a time warp when you're just having wow, this conversation that's awesome yeah that's crazy wow okay uh-huh so i mean um we might as well let it go for another 10 just to hit that two yeah, hours. Why let's not? Do right? it. Let's do it. I feel like this is this is going to be such an episode that I'm excited to drop because I, I like I know so many people are going to like fuck with it. You know what I mean? Um, and actually, I, I appreciate it because, like I said in the beginning, actually, I was like, yo, there's no like filter on this podcast. Like, I want people to know that, like, yo, whatever I'm saying is exactly what the fuck I'm saying. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to be myself regardless. I mean, I chose to be a rapper for a reason. Right. Like, I wasn't trying to be fitting into these other boxes that I just don't identify with, mm -hmm. right? So why would I stop now? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I'm just going to speak my shit. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, like, 
the fact that you were able to pull these um like topics out of me mm. on my podcast shit that i haven't shared before right mm. so like that that's dope and that's why you know like i just really feel like the impact i i just know it like i just know it's gonna be crazy mm, i so appreciate that it's like so interesting because it's like like i said you never fully know it's you can't really know your impact right you only know what people tell you and when i had the launch for songs of irie there was like this man in the audience this is so random but he was like 90 six came about the audience and was like what she's saying is true this happened and i was there i survived the revolution and i marched in this revolution that happened in jamaica and we there are stories and the reason that you know black people are going through what we're going through is because we're these stories are locked inside of us and pe people aren't telling our stories and we're not hearing ourselves and Damn. tell and it was literally like it Yo. was just like sent from god i was like and I was so nervous about my book launch too, but like he came up out of nowhere. His name was Alvin. I'm slipping his last name right now, but his name was Alvin. And uh, he was like, my time has, has passed, but this is your time, like your generation, like be the Holy change, shit. come on. It's like- Yo, he, that got me shook right now. He literally said that I was a part of that revolution. I was a student when that was happening and we marched. I know, I have like chills. He's like, we marched. Um, in the Mona revolution, which was just a rev it was a big revolution that happened. It was the same thing, political violence that they were speaking out against. But it just shows you like our time is so limited. Like, what are we really going to do with it? And I want to tell the truth. Like, that's what I'm interested in, you know? Yo. Yeah. Yo. I know. I know. Yo. But you said it though. It's just like a blessing to be alive in this time period, especially oh. as artists and creators, you know? And it yeah. is a huge responsibility. I think sometimes it can be really disappointing when you look to mainstream and it's just not that. But then I also don't want to like discount all the other artists that maybe aren't getting that platform, but are really creating like real authentic stuff because it's yeah. out there, you know, oh, for sure, for sure. Absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I, I believe it. And, um, you know, we got to we just got to we got to support that shit. Like, so right. anybody who's watching this right now, um, you know what I'm saying? Like check it out like this yeah. is real this is like some real shit like if you you know what i mean we're talking about stuff that's like ingrained in our society where these are concepts that are ingrained in our society like if you're gonna if you can if you can uh, you know like hip-hop or afro beats now is popping off and shit like that like yo this is shit that if you fuck with it yo this comes from people who history you know what i mean like mm -hmm. really like went through some shit so if you appreciate this side of shit but you don't understand the other side right then i'm not saying it makes you hypocritical but at the end of the day you're very um ignorant as fuck to not appreciate um you know these different uh nuances in yeah. this same group of people that you apparently right. love, love in you know <laughs> what i mean like i mean my dad always says like if you don't know uh where you're coming from you can't know where you're going and i think it's important to know where all of these things come from and it's also just interesting like history is just interesting like if we don't want to repeat the past we have to like know what the past was and we have to like learn from it like we can't yeah. be afraid to look at it you know yeah accountability like yeah. that inner work yo yeah yeah big purr <laughs> yo uh, yo um so i guess with that being said uh, you know i'm sure everybody's gonna check you out um but you know let them know where they can find you yes uh, and uh like your socials and all that kind of stuff let yeah. them know let them know so you guys can find me on instagram at asha ashanti a-s-h-a-a-s-h-a-n-t-i um and on twitter as asha brom a-s-h-a-b-r-o-m and my book my new book songs of irie is available now everywhere books are sold you can get it on amazon you can get it at barnes and noble chapters everywhere so yeah check it out and my book hurricane summer as well so yeah yo love it love it <laughs> thank you for having me like truly i'm so in awe of everything that you're doing and i look at you as a true pioneer and i just mm. pray that you continue to just like hone that spirit and never lose that because you're so necessary in the game and mm. i just think there's so many people that are just going to benefit and gain from what you have to offer and the gift that god has given you so yo yeah. thank you so much i that really hits like so hard and also thank you for coming um and blessing this you know what i mean podcast like for real like it's just 
yo i'm i'm definitely happy that uh, hey link up we said we were gonna do it <laughs> yeah 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 definitely yeah love it um are you gonna be in la at any point i am in the new year okay so sick. i'm so. excited to be back in the west coast so i'll see you over there and we'll yes. do another one yes oh my god yes okay. i love that i love sick. that perfect okay cool yay later y'all bye guys are you high? Are you nice? Are you okay? okay. Do you mind if I ride with you low key? Low key. It's alright, I'll be fine, I'm on low key.